Hey guys, right now it is my pleasure to be joined by Professor Graeme Davey. Graeme is the Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of Sussex, whose research interests extend across mental health problems in general, and specifically anxiety and worry. Professor Davey is a former president of the British Psychological Society and is currently editor-in-chief of the Journal of Experimental Psychopathology, which publishes cutting-edge research on anxiety and anxiety-related problems. Highly recommend. He is also author of the fantastic book, The Anxiety Epidemic, The Causes of Our Modern Day Anxiety. And he has very generously agreed to take time out of his hectic schedule to join us today to discuss some of these important issues. Graeme, thank you so much for being here. I'm so honored to get to talk to you again and thrilled to welcome you to the Anxiety Support Summit. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. So maybe if you can just give us a little bit of a background to, to the work you do, because it really is fascinating and, and, and quite groundbreaking. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm basically by training an experimental psycho, uh, psychopathologist, and uh, uh, that means I'm interested in finding experimental ways of understanding mental health problems generally. And uh, in the last 30 years or so, I've been primarily interested in anxiety-based problems. And um, I've done research on uh, uh, phobias initially and what causes uh, phobias, which is itself quite fascinating. Mm. Um, and then more recently on anxiety generally and understanding how people acquire anxiety disorders um, and in particular, things like um, pathological worrying. Everybody worries uh, to various degrees, and some people find it a chronic problem. Um, uh, the research we've done has been um, the kind which we can actually try and understand how normal worry, which is often quite productive, can turn into something which is distressing and um, disruptive. Um, and that's the kind of research I've been doing with the group that I have at Sussex University. We've been doing that research now for 20, 30 years, and uh, it's been a, a, an interesting journey and, a, and a, a good journey because I think we're beginning to understand a lot of those anxiety-based problems. And, of mm -hmm. course, that is the kind of knowledge that will feed into a new treatments and hopefully successful treatments for these kinds of disorders. Yes, very interesting. So we're, in terms of pathological worry, how, how does like, obviously, as you said, we all worry, but what is the research showing us that where it becomes kind of pathological and, and damaging to our health? Yeah, it's um, one thing that, Pathological worriers aren't, is they aren't born warriors. Every uh, chronic warrior will say to you, I'm a born warrior, but they're not. They're not born that way. Um, there's usually something um, along the way that has turned them into um, pathological warriors. And a lot of that's to do with what they believe about the worry process. Um, they believe that worrying is something very important to do in order to stop bad things happening. And if you don't worry, then bad things will happen. And they hold quite strong beliefs about that, very strong beliefs about that. Mm. Um, and of course, what we know about uh, our worrying, uh, most people from a personal point of view will know that uh, a lot of what they worry about actually never happens because we create lots of different scenarios in our head that we want to be sure we can deal with. Um, but most of those, 85% uh, of those worries that we have never happen. And I actually saw a, a paper just published uh, a couple of weeks ago that actually had, had done an objective study of the percentage of worries, of, of pathological worries that didn't, worries that, that didn't happen. And uh, their figure was even higher. It was 91%. So... Uh, Basically, only one out of 10 of those worries that you have 
if you're a pathological warrior, are going to happen. Um, but what the pathological warrior does is then says to themselves, oh, it didn't happen. So my, my worrying worked. My worrying must have worked. So I'll do that again because it, there's, there's a kind of superstitious belief that mm -hmm. the worrying is actually going to, going to stop things happening. And it, it's, it's a superstitious belief. But then it becomes a very strong belief and it drives worrying in all sorts of situations for some people. Wow, I've never heard it put like that. It's kind of like the, the law of attraction working in a reverse in a way where it's actually yeah. causing you. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, and, and those, uh, uh, you know, those, those worries are very strong. And you put that together with a kind of, most people worry when they're in a negative mood. Uh, and by negative, I mean, they're, they're, they may be feeling anxious or a little bit sad. Um, or a little bit tired um, uh, and uh, most people who worry will be implicitly saying to themselves something like oh uh, have I worried enough about this yet in order to solve it um, they're not they're not actually articulating it but what they are doing is is implicitly saying that to themselves and what most people do is they default to their mood uh, and if their mood is negative, their mood is telling them, no, you haven't solved this problem yet. No, you haven't worried enough. Uh, you've got to keep going. And that's why some people find their worrying uncontrollable because this unconscious process is going on underneath their worrying where they're comparing their, their uh, success that they're worrying with their mood. Um, and that's why it becomes perseverative. You can't stop it once it starts sometimes because that uncon unconscious process is going on. Mm. That's, it's so interesting. And I, I'm, I'm sure so many people listening can relate. I mean, just the other day I was, I, I pulled out my phone after, I don't know, the gym or something. And I was just looking at it and just something annoyed me. And I was, as often happens when you pull out your phone these days, and it, 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 was, it wasn't just something I saw in the media or news or something like that. It was something relating to me. And, and, uh, and I probably saw five good things. And I was, I was on my bike and I was coming home and I was here going, oh, I'm annoyed now. And then I was here going, why am I annoyed? And I couldn't actually remember what had happened that had annoyed me. And I was here going, so I was trying to rack my brain and I was here going like, no, Nikki, stop this. This is crazy. Like it, it's, it's irrelevant. You've forgotten about it already. You don't have to go back and seek it out. It's like, it's, you know, some crap on social media that really doesn't matter anyway. And, I, and even, even when I got home, I was here going, I was still <laughs> looking for it. Like, it's just, yeah. habitual. you got to get to this thing so you can understand or process it or something. Um, that's very strange indeed. Uh, um, yeah, I, think that, um, I was just going to say, I think a lot of people recently have been uh, um, contacting me to say that, you know, I'm just getting angry about what's on social media and I don't understand why that's happening and, uh, and so on. Um, um, uh, uh, but if you're the kind of person who tunes in a lot to your mood unconsciously, to actually tell you not just how you feel, but whether you should be doing something or not, then uh, that's going to happen a lot. You're going, you know, you're probably going to um, feel annoyed and not remember what you're annoyed about. Mm. Amazing. And what, what would be some things that we could do to kind of break these patterns? Um, I'm a great believer in, um, in, in people trying to, uh, mood plays lots of different important roles in generating anxiety-based psychopathology and symptoms. It, your mood is, is desperately important. So um, I'm a great believer in people finding ways to lift their moods immediately when they can and being aware of that. Um, there are a number of processes there. One is you, you kind of need to be able to become aware of when you're in a negative mood, when you're feeling anxious, depressed, tired, 
you may be in pain. All of those things are quite negative moods that, go, that are going to feed into the processes that will generate uh, anxiety, negative, more negative mood, uh, and, and certain symptoms, anxiety-based symptoms. Um, uh, but how you lift your mood is, is, it, it is often quite personal. You know, a, an individual will know what kinds of things make them feel good. Um, but there are a few obvious things that I put in, 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 in my book. Um, the obvious simple ones are upbeat music, you know, mm. listen to Queen um, uh, doing um, Don't Stop Me Now. That's, that, that's uh, so I'm told that's, that's the most upbeat song that uh, yeah. exists. Uh, uh, and uh, that's not just me saying that. I'm not necessarily a Queen fan, but uh, basically uh, I think a Dutch psychologist looked at uh, how to measure upbeat music, and that's the one that came out top. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's on one of my feel-good playlists as a result of reading your book. Yeah. Along with the other, I think you listed ten yeah. off. Abba was in there, and there were some yeah, great yeah. songs. I, uh, unfortunately for me, Abba um, will actually have the opposite effect uh, oh. but, uh, for other people. I, I know baby. it's very, very positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, things like that. Um, lifting your mood. Exercise is a good one. Uh, we know that exercise is extremely good for lifting mood in, in many different ways. If you're sad, exercise will lift your mood. Uh, and if you're anxious as well, it will lift your mood. And it doesn't have to be excessive exercise. I, I mean, I, in my book I say you can just walk around, the, walk around the block, just getting out into the fresh air, um, moving your legs around and getting into a different environment can lift your mood. Um, and again, um, mindfulness, you know, uh, most of anxiety exists in your head, whether it's worrying or just uh, uh, anxious stress. It exists in your head, uh, but it's, it's all about the future. It's not about the present. Mm -hmm. And what you do need, uh, if you're uh, feeling um, anxious or low, is, is to get back into the present from, from those things that are bugging you in the, in the future. Um, and my, mindfulness is very good for that. And uh, you can um, very easily and quickly pick up how to do a few very basic mindful exercises to bring you back into the, uh, into the present. Mm. And it's just about having that mindfulness has come up time and again throughout this, um, throughout this series of interviews. And it's just about having the patience, I think also, so often we have these skewed expectations that we're supposed, you know, instant gratification is what we seek. And if we don't get the results immediately, we give up. Um, mm -hmm. But you can just kind of integrate it on a daily basis. And those little tiny changes will have immense impact on your reality in the future, be it six months, be it a year, but you'll soon feel better quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the, 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 the things that really fascinated me about your book and what I absolutely love and I've never uh, seen written about before is obviously you go into great detail about the different anxiety disorders and even some of the, the symptoms, uh, the different types of symptoms that might be associated with different disorders. Um, and that in itself, I guess, is really quite detailed. And I recommend anyone who's interested in this stuff to go out and get the book. But what I'd love to know is like, what is the, because I think there's a misunderstanding, uh, you know, what is the difference between anxiety and an anxiety disorder? Um, well, basically, we can look at anxiety is, is, is one of a number of neg in negative emotions. And we, we, we only call them negative emotions because they, when we experience them, they're not particularly nice to experience, basically. Um, uh, but, you know, we wouldn't still, as a species, be experiencing anxiety if it didn't have some evolutionary benefit. Um, we can be fairly sure of that. Um, the benefit of anxiety um, is fairly clear. It, it, it makes us uh, 
more aware. Uh, it, it helps us to deal with future threats and challenges. Uh, that's the focus of anxiety. So it has, um, in many ways, a survival value. Um, but there are people out there who find anxiety, basic levels of anxiety and standard levels of, of anxiety, they find it exhilarating rather than threatening and rather uh, uh, as uh, distressing. It's, it's only when that anxiety, you start to lose control of that anxiety. Um, and it's when it becomes distressing um, as an experience uh, that it starts to become diagnosable as a disorder. So distress is one of the things. The other thing is, is if your anxiety is interfering with your normal daily living, if it's interfering with your, your work, it's interfering with your family life, your social life, if it's preventing you doing things that you would normally be doing, then uh, again, that's another diagnostic criterion for, for it being an anxiety disorder uh, of that mm. kind. And there are a number of, there are about five or six basic anxiety disorders, and they're all very different. Uh, they're all very, very different, um, uh, which is fascinating because we still don't know why a person gets one particular anxiety disorder rather than another. Um, when you know when when anxiety levels rise. Mm. Um, what, so what is the most common of it, it, when when you talk about being a disting a distinguishable factor if it's if it's like having a negative impact on their their normal day to day life is that in, alone does that qualify someone as having an anxiety disorder. Are there other things, criteria that need to be met? Yeah, the two, uh, for, all, for most mental health problems, the two um, to be diagnosable and, and clinically significant, um, the, the two features are that the individual defines the experience distressing, mm -hmm. distressing, uh, just so distressing that they uh, might want to seek help for it. Um, and the second criterion is, is that um, it severely disrupts daily living for them. Uh, they can't do their job properly. Uh, they can't uh, undertake family responsibilities in the way that they would normally. And um, it affects social, socializing as well. Um, those are the two criteria. Uh, and, that's, uh, and those two criteria are significant across all of the mental health problems that you're going to come across, not just anxiety. Okay. And so what kind of numbers are we looking at today of people that are struggling or suffering with anxiety disorders? And I know you're based in the UK, all your research is there, so we could just... Well, you know, uh, it, that, that's been something that, that's been quite difficult to... to ascertain uh, because you know we have we, we haven't had a lot of data on that over the years to actually see if, if you know mental health problems are increasing in frequency is quite hard uh, because the figures uh, are often collected in different ways in different countries so they're difficult to compare but um, to try and get a handle on it I mean the first thing we can do is just look at anxiety uh, itself and um, the United Kingdom Office for National Statistics has started collecting anxiety uh, data from the general population and have been doing that now for about five or six years, I think. Um, and they do it every year. Um, and they simply ask people right now, in the, you know, yesterday, mm -hmm. how anxious did you feel on a scale of 0 to 10? And what's interesting about that is that... Um, it doesn't change much. You'll find that one in five people are in the high category. They're six to ten. Um, and then there'll be two in five people who are in the almost low category, below two. Uh, um, so you can say that something like 40% of the population doesn't really feel anxious and anxiety doesn't bother them. 20% um, of the population... Um, does feel a lot of anxiety. And in the middle, we've got another 40% who probably 
feel a little bit anxious now and again, but may be, um, but, but may be vulnerable to uh, more severe anxiety problems at, at various times in their life. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a snapshot, right? That's a snapshot now, uh, if you like, um, of, of anxiety. Um, and I think those figures look very comparable with other figures we get from around the world, especially in the, the US and in, in, in Europe as well. So it, it, it looks to be a standard kind of figure. Um, when it comes to anxiety disorders, uh, there was a group at, um, I think, Queensland University in Australia who did a world, a global study of, of anxiety disorders. And they, they found that one in 14 people worldwide was suffering an anxiety disorder, which is quite severe. Yeah, um, we'll one in 14. One in 14 worldwide, globally. Yeah, that's, that was, uh, I think, around 7% of the population are currently experiencing quite severe anxiety-based problems, um, which is a lot. You know, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of people needing to have some kind of, 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 of treatment for something they find distressing and disruptive in their lives. Um, of course, not all of them are getting that, getting that treatment they need, I'm sure. But um, it gives you some idea of the, you know, the global nature of anxiety-based problems. Um, and how common they are. In fact, anxiety has probably overtaken depression as the now the most common mental health problem uh, in the last few years. Mm. Wow. Um, that's, that's like one in four, you're right, it is a lot. But I, you know, I've, it's, so, it's so strange because sometimes I've read it's one in four people well, maybe we struggle with an anxiety disorder in their lifetime, so that might be different. Um, but um, yeah, you hear so many different figures, yeah. but one in four teams. Yeah, yeah that, the, the, those figures I've just given you are snapshot figures at any one point in time. If yeah. you're looking at lifetime, then we are talking now, um, uh, mental health generally, one in four, one in three, even uh, being, being talked about. Uh, and for anxiety, that's almost certainly one in four, one in, uh, even one in three, going to suffer some anxiety at a level which would be diagnosable as a mental health problem. Mm. Um, what, what, do you, what is the most common disorder that you see in the research? Um, in terms of anxiety, um, it varies, uh, you know, it, it, uh, the most common ones uh, tend to be, well, let me go through them for you. I think yeah, that's probably the, that's if, great. if you've got time, we can just go through them individually. I mean, uh, specific phobias, um, probably two out of three people have a phobia uh, of something. Um, and I, de I defy most people to say they don't have a phobia. Uh, because I think everybody has a little phobia of their own, which uh, they've developed on their own, even if they keep it quiet. Um, uh, and but, but usually those phobias are, 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 are subclinical in the sense that, that you might be anxious, but you're only anxious about one thing, whether that's heights or whether that's uh, water or s small little animals uh, like uh, spiders and snakes and, and those kinds of things. Um, uh, they're, they're the kind of things that, that, that people are going to be phobic of. And, and they're very specific. So most people who are phobic of something can easily spend their time avoiding their phobia without it disrupting their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as every spider phobic will know, uh, gosh, they don't like spiders at all, but uh, life can be pretty successfully manoeuvred through without having to come into contact with a spider. Yeah, um, especially if you're not if, living if you're in Australia. Careful. So it doesn't disrupt life too much. Um, so although phobias are quite common, they're usually subclinical because people don't get too distressed about them. Um, 
Social phobia is an, or social anxiety disorder is something which is just a, a little bit different. Um, and one thing I should have said about phobias is they're all grouped as one, as one kind of anxiety disorder. Uh, uh, but they all probably have different causes. Uh, phobias, uh, different phobias don't usually have the same cause and they're, they're quite involved causes as well, which I, I do talk about in the book. Um, but they're all very different causes. So the person who's got a height phobia would have, would have acquired that height phobia in a very different way to someone who has a spider phobia, for example. Um, uh, social phobia is, again, something which is, is, is very common, uh, and it's now called social anxiety disorder. Um, it's, uh, it's arguably one of the most prevalent anxiety disorders and, and that's a fear of uh um it's a fear of uh uh performing in public in some way giving a presentation even eating in public and it's under underlain by a a, a belief that uh, uh someone is either inferior or uh, is going to be criticized for what they're doing or they will uh, make a faux pas or whatever. Uh, uh, and those kinds of beliefs, again, are very difficult to dislodge once they're established in a person's, uh, person's mind. Um, so uh, social phobia can be uh, pretty much a lifelong disorder in some cases because uh, most people will spend their time avoiding the kinds of social situations in which uh, that anxiety is going to um, is going to come to the fore. Mm -hmm. And then we've got um, panic disorder, which is a very specific kind of uh, uh, anxiety-based problem. Uh, and that is um, that is when people have regular panic attacks that they feel they can't control. And and, and that's quite a distressing disorder. I, I've had a couple of bouts. Of, of uh, panic disorder, which is it's very distressing because it can affect your whole life because you don't know when these panic attacks are going to occur. Uh, very often people will think that they're very life-threatening um, uh, experiences. They'll, they'll, they'll either believe that they're going to have a heart attack or they're going to pass out or they're going to be sick in public. Uh, which they will find very embarrassing. Um, uh, usually, uh, with panic attacks, none of those consequences ever happen. Mm. Um, but for some people, the panic attacks keep reoccurring. And often they reoccur because people try to make themselves safe. Uh, um, the basis of agoraphobia, for example, people who find it very difficult to leave their home, is that um, they stay in their home uh, primarily because uh, they don't want to go outside and maybe experience a panic attack in public. Mm. Um, and uh, an interesting fact about the recent uh, coronavirus pandemic is, of course, that a lot of people who've had, who had panic disorder have found that their symptoms have been alleviated during lockdown. I thought um, that might be the case. It, 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 yes, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and there's also quite a bit of evidence from uh, more measured uh, surveys that um, such people actually feel safer in lockdown because they don't have to go out into this very threatening world where they might um, be unable to cope. Um, uh, what yeah. will happen when lockdowns are fully lifted we uh it, it, it's difficult to see but you can already see there are some people getting very a little bit anxious about uh going yeah. back out into, into the real world again yeah, yeah for sure. it's fascinating because I, I put a, just a small little survey together and i was just trying to see how decipher how people were coping and and many people with with social anxiety or you, you know particularly or agoraphobia or they would panic, they were just saying, this is great, I don't have to leave my house. I don't have to, so they, they, just, they don't have to deal with their anxiety. So it was really yeah. just a, 
a gift for them. Um, yeah. Well, the interesting thing about that is that suddenly uh, it, it makes us all aware of, of, of where a lot of that anxiety is coming from. And it's coming from the real world. Um, it's coming from interacting with the real world. Um, mm. Even with panic disorder, it's coming from, from interacting with the real world. Um, uh, and and it, it makes that, the, the, the lockdowns have made that really quite obvious uh, now, hopefully to people who um, are suffering those symptoms as well. Um, uh, um, and hopefully, well, insight of that kind can be helpful mm -hmm. as well. Um, after panic disorder, we've got um, generalized anxiety disorder, which is, again, one of the most common of the anxiety disorders. And that's the, the, the main cardinal diagnostic fe feature of that is uh, pathological worrying. These are your worriers. Um, and that worrying is also associated with um, a lot of tension, bodily tension uh, and bodily anxiety as well. Um, and again, if, if you're going to treat that kind of disorder, uh, it's important to target pathological worrying and try and help the person let go of their worrying and, and find, uh, find ways in which you can help people to uh, manage their worrying rather than let it take control of them in the way that it often does. A lot of people find that difficult. Um, and it, again, it boils down to, you know, uh, whenever you come across someone who's a pathological warrior, the first thing they say to you is, I'm a born warrior. And, and they're not. I've, I've tried to explain, uh, if you like, to, to, to people who are pathological warriors, that they weren't born warriors. They have acquired the ability um, to worry uh, at, a, at, at an Olympic level, if you like, um, uh, uh, over their lifetime. Um, but the reason such people often say things like, uh, I'm a born warrior, is because that it's a plea, don't try and change me. I have to do it. it it's, it's a compulsion, but I have to do it. So don't try and change me because uh, um, I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. Um, so it's that kind of a plea. And because of that, it, it, as a compulsion, it's very, very similar to an obsessive compulsive disorder um, uh, because it's compulsion. Um, and the, because of that, again, a, a lot of people find it quite difficult to let go of their worrying. And because of that GAD, uh, which is uh, the, the diagnostic criteria for pathological worrying, um, uh, GAD is often, again, a, a lifelong problem that people have because uh, um, it's, very, it's often very difficult for people to let go of, of, of that compulsion. Um, and that brings me on to the, the, the final um, anxiety disorder, which is obsessive compulsive disorder, which is uh, most people will be, I suspect, familiar with, um, which is characterized by um, uncontrollable obsessive thoughts or also uncontrollable uh, compulsions. Um, and the two most common examples are um, OCD checking, where people have to check, for example, that the, the, the places are secure, like the, the stove is off, the doors are locked, the windows are shut. Um, and the other one is, uh, again, which is probably most familiar to most people, is, is, uh, is OCD washing, which is where people have a fear of contamination and they will spend uh, long times making sure that they're not contaminated or they're not going to contaminate other people. Uh, and they do that by spending, uh, going through rituals which uh, uh, enable them to feel clean uh, and often washing their hands, for example, for long periods of time um, immediately 
after they feel they might have been contaminated, that kind of thing. And again, OCD, uh, because it's underlain by these rituals and compulsions, um, a lot of people find it quite difficult to, to let go of that. Um, and, and so often it can be a, a lifelong problem for some people. Um, and a lot of people, OCD as well is, is a very slow onset disorder. So it doesn't suddenly come along and hit you like panic disorder does suddenly at a time. It, it, it becomes very, it comes on very slow. Um, and because of that, a lot of people don't seek treatment for OCD until quite late on when, when all the symptoms are quite heavily established. Mm. And you can see that all, all of those uh, anxiety disorders, are, they're very different. They're very different in how they manifest, but they're all underlain by anxiety. Anxiety is there keeping those symptoms going in one yeah. way or another. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, it's a, yeah, it is so interesting. And, I, I, you know, I, I know for myself, I, I like... I would have started off a panic disorder and it was like, it was five years before I heard what a panic attack was, but I, you know, I was having these panic attacks scared it for my life. And then I was anxious all the time to the point where I was at times scared to go out of the house, never really comfortable going out of the house. I definitely have massive social anxiety disorder, social anxiety as well. Um, no OC, no OCD. Hopefully that's not coming at me, <laughs> but, um, they they can be quite incestuous. Am I am I right in saying that? Um, how, how do you mean? So, well, can it, you elaborate? Uh, yeah. So, um, is it, it's possible to have m many of them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, I, it, well, it, it's rare to see someone who has a a lot of them, but it, it's it's quite um, it's quite common for one anxiety disorder to be um, comorbid with at least one other anxiety mm. disorder. Uh, for example, it's very it's very common to see a specific phobia uh, with panic disorder uh, and social phobia with panic disorder. Um, uh, GAD often very comorbid with OCD, for example. Okay, wow. And that, uh, that, that, of course, makes us think, well, maybe there's some common, common underlying causes here which, uh, which, which uh, make some people have, uh, you know, two, a couple of anxiety disorders rather than, 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 than just the one. And what what sort of underlying causes would would you see in the research? Um, well, that that would that would take a, a, a bit of time, I think, because yeah, uh, uh, as as I said, even even within a single category like specific phobias, uh, the the causes for individually different phobias are all very different. Mm -hmm. um, very different. Let me give you an example from that, for example. Um, height phobia uh, is quite prevalent. I'm, I'm certainly height phobic. You, you know, you can try um, uh, dragging me up a ladder if you, can tr if you can do it, but you won't get me up the top of a ladder. I, I'm, I'm extremely height phobic. Um, and, uh, you know, we've discovered from our research that height phobia actually shares a lot of features in common with panic disorder. And of course, I, I, I also had panic disorder and, and uh, a couple of times uh, earlier in my life. Uh, and height phobia, as an adolescent, is usually a predictor of panic disorder later in life as well. And the reason is they have very similar underlying causes, both height phobia and um, and. Uh, panic disorder uh, are underlaid by the fact that people uh, tune into their own bodily sensations and misinterpret them. Um, they will tune into their bodily sensations and will always 
almost always see a threatening kind of interpretation to that bodily sensation, even though most bodily sensations you will ever experience on a daily basis are usually benign uh, and are usually uh, ambiguous in what they might be saying. Um, mm -hmm. But some people develop a bias to interpreting bodily sensations as being negative. Like, you know, if my tummy rumbles, oh, I'm going to be sick. If my heart starts to beat a bit faster, I'm not getting excited by something, I'm going to have a heart attack. Um, it's how you interpret those. And that's true of both uh, panic disorder and height phobia. When you get up a height, you, you start looking, uh, you've developed uh, looking at your bodily sensations, uh, your, your legs might be feeling a bit wobbly and then suddenly you, you've gone into a big anxiety bout at wherever you are on a height and it becomes very difficult then for you to, uh, um, to actually put up with that experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and that's just two very, you know, that's just, that's just the cause of the very two, what turn out to be quite different uh, anxiety problems, height phobia and panic disorder. They have the same, they have the same cause. Um, but other phobias, like spider phobia, um, is, is, is very different. You know, that, that's uh, a lot of, the, phob uh, the spider phobia experience is underlined by a, uh, the emotion of disgust, which is a, a, a you know a food rejection emotion, mm -hmm. um, and that probably has a long history, uh, going back to times when spiders were considered to be poisonous, uh, and they would poison food uh, and so on. Which is, and uh, spiders were often considered to be harbingers of the plagues that occurred throughout our history. Um, and so culturally, we seem to have associated spiders with disgust. Yeah. And, uh, and that gets transmitted socially uh, in, a, in a way which we don't yet understand, but it does. Uh, that's why many, many people um, uh, fear spiders. Um, and also, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the most common phobias in, in, in Westernized societies. Yeah, no, of course. Not. And in Eastern, they're, they're eating them for dinner. Um, That's right. Which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's all so fascinating. But the pandemic obviously ha has shaken the whole world in ways we could never have envisioned. I mean, I, I think it's going to be, we're not going to be looking back five years from now going, holy shit, like that happened. And we're still trying to wrap our heads around it. Obviously, the media is, is injecting a lot of fear into, into society. So what are you seeing in the research in terms of the impact? Obviously, we're people, many people with social anxiety or panic disorder are kind of like enjoying the stay at home. But uh, is the research telling a different story as well um, with people that might not have necessarily had high anxiety beforehand now? Yeah, them? I think, it, it, again, it, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, um, there was a group at Sheffield University who, who were just starting a a survey of people uh, at, right at the beginning of lockdown in the UK to look at their anxiety levels and see uh, and see how uh, the lockdown affected and you know their mental health in, in, in a variety of ways. One of, one of which was how anxious they were feeling, uh, and and they they took measures just before the lockdown and just after the lockdown and in. The two or three days after the lockdown, um, levels of anxiety, well, uh, roughly one in five people prior to the lockdown were experiencing high levels of anxiety, which is the, the level I talked about earlier at a, at a, you know, a, at a, uh, a national level, which would be normal, one in five. 
Um, when we went into lockdown for the first two or three days, um, that increased to around 40%. So it was two in five um, who were experiencing high levels of anxiety. But what was quite revealing in that study was that within three to four days of lockdown, it had gone back down again to the one in five level, experiencing high anxiety. So um, th there was no extended, if you like, uh, anxiety in people that didn't already experience some anxiety. A lot of people adapted quite quickly to lockdown once they'd got over the, the, the anxious surprise, if you like, of it happening and what it might entail. Um, and I, I think that's one thing that will come out of this, 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 this pandemic and the associated lockdown is that, yeah, people are very adaptable. You know, they, they won't feel too anxious. Um, at the end of it, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's still too early days to say exactly what else will happen. I mean, a lot of people have been predicting um, a big mental health crisis as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown. Mm. Um, we haven't really seen um, much evidence of that yet, but that may simply be because no one's looked closely enough yet because we're still in it. Um, mm. and, and as I said, I think that those people who were suffering anxiety at the onset of the uh, lockdown may well begin to start to feel quite anxious again once we do come uh, right out of lockdown. Um, because again, most anxiety problems are caused by threats and challenges posed by our existence in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, and having to go out there in the real world again and face up to those threat things that, that, that the individual finds threatening and challenging um, uh, uh, may well be problematic again after having been, if you like, locked down safely uh, for, for many months. So I, again, I don't think I don't think we yet know the extent of it. The only thing that we can say, probably, is that uh, the lockdown itself didn't cause a massive increase in anxiety problems, mm. um, and people did seem to be quite adaptable. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to know what what will happen. I I, I think as well that the the fact that people are being taken care of quite well, certainly in Western society by their governments at this stage. Um, and when that gets taken away, maybe, um, and more normal life resumes and, and the, the mess that's left behind uh, has to be cleaned up, then it might have an impact then. But it's always interesting because, you know, when we, when, when we write about this, and when I say when we write about this, I talk about people like myself, and it's like mental health crisis, we're in this, we're in that, and you know, maybe it's not as big as an epidemic or a crisis, the mental health is just like, it seems to not deviate too much. But if you're experiencing it, that it, it, it kind of, the assumption becomes that this is everything that's going on in the world. Mm. A bit like that for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, again, you know, we, we, it's, it's difficult to judge uh, what the, how the pandemic will affect, subsequently affect uh, uh, mental health. Um, and, and we know that there are things that are going to happen, like uh, uh, increasingly people will become unemployed as businesses uh, may fail because of uh, problems such as that. Um, uh, there are lots of factors like unemployment, um, financial problems, paying the mortgage, mm -hmm. um, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, worrying about whether your kid's going to get schooling um, uh, and, and so on. Uh, that we have, we we simply haven't seen the effects of that yet, but. I'm sure there will be some. Mm. And 
obviously we know governments are not very good at supporting any kind of mental health at all when you compare it to other because it is like there's higher mortality rates as you discuss in your book with some in, very interesting figures um what what are some of the re reasons you believe that people don't really get help um well two, the, uh, there are two reasons there i think one is that um it's only recently that, that people have become aware of what things are mental health problems. Uh, uh, or even, even understanding their own experiences, experiences of depression, experiences of anxiety, for example. Um, in the past, people will almost certainly many, many people would almost certainly have just taken that as being something that is, is a part of everyday life, if you like. Um, and it's not something that they would have sought treatment for, mm -hmm. but because of the increased, especially over the last 10, 20 years, the increased um, uh, profile of, of mental health uh, generally in society, they now understand that this is something that maybe they, they should be seeking treatment for. Um, so that that's important, um, um, and uh, the world, you know, the world changes, and um, uh, for whatever reason, we we are living in a a world which not only has pandemics, it also has a lot of uh, it has a lot of divisive politics around the world, for example, which uh, are often anxiety provoking. We have social media, which we didn't have, what, 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which can generate all sorts of uh, information, which people find anxiety provoking and threatening, um, sure. even amongst a group of friends. Um, so again, I think all of those things are contributors to, to, to mental health problems generally. Um, but it's also the case that, um, Governments don't fund mental health uh, um, services in anything like the way that they fund physical health services. Um, I, 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 I can't remember, I know the figures are in my book, um, but it, it's staggering, the difference is staggering uh, between um, the amount of funding that goes towards uh, physical health services as opposed to mental health services. And yet, um, mental health problems contribute enormously to uh, um, uh, uh, li you know, life expectancy issues. They, they contribute enormously to um, loss of productivity in business and, uh, um, and so on. Um, but they're not seen as, still not seen as being important. Mm, yeah, I, I, I just picked up your book as you said that there, because I think this will be interesting for people watching. And I just had a flick because I knew I had a highlight and I just at the off chance, I landed on the page and I think I did. Um, mind report, I'll just read this out. I might be completely wrong in the wrong chapter here. Mind reported that local authorities in England spend on average 1.3% of their public health budget on mental health. The UK government spends an average of £1,571 per year on cancer research per individual. The equivalent for mental health is 150, 50 times less at £10 per mental health patient. Uh, and it goes on and on. The, the yeah, figures are yeah. more I mean, and more staggering. Yeah, the figures are staggering, yes. Um, and they don't get highlighted enough, I, I, I think. Um, uh, and they're staggering when you look at um, the amount of um, uh, uh, time, for example, that people are not able to work because of mental health problems and compare that with physical health problems. And mental health problems are one of the top um, uh, the, the, the top health problems that contribute mm. most loss loss of productivity in in um, in the economy, 
for example. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it baffles me because it's so brutal. And if they, like, it, 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 you know, prevention is obviously the greatest cure. They could put it in a system to educate children uh, on their emotions from an early age and just provide services to help people in need and really dive deep into this. And I just don't like, because it, it affects, you know, it, it doesn't just affect the individual, it affects the family. There's a real ripple effect off this and it, it affects the world we're living in. And you just start going, like, why wouldn't you like invest in this? Why just kick it to the curb all the time? <laughs> it just it just makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, it's brutal. I'd be so ashamed. Um, but uh, so I'm conscious of your time, and I, 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 you know, I always love talking to you. It's always so insightful, and and I could go listen to you all day long but what would be just some tips that you would give to people that are struggling today and and they're you know they have a feeling of hopelessness and they don't know what to do and they don't trust people or whatever yeah i think um uh yeah i <laughs> that might be quite uh, that's quite a range of problems uh you know uh, yeah. I, the, the first thing I say, don't, don't go out yourself and try and change the world because that might be a little bit too difficult. Um, but um, if you are experiencing anxiety, for example, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to understand that anxiety is, is a perfectly normal emotion experienced by, by many, many people. Um, um, and, you know, you're not going crazy if you have an anxiety problem. It, 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 it's often quite a normal reaction to things that are going on in your life and you can seek help for it. Um, um, so try and try and accept anxiety if you can, if it, if it becomes too overwhelming for you, then clearly uh, obviously, and obviously seek, seek, seek help and support and treatment for it. Um, uh, that's important. Um, again, you know, to, to avoid to avoid kind of uh, anxiety-based symptoms taking you over, um, which they can do sometimes, uh, is first of all, lift your mood. Uh, and I, I, I keep going back to that, but I think it's desperately important because if you, if you let your mood drop and drop and drop, that just feeds anxiety um, and also depression as well. Um, and it feeds the symptoms associated with anxiety, um, like worrying, uh, and, and, uh, and it makes it feel uncontrollable. So have a think about ways in which you personally know that you can lift your mood and have those available to yourself uh, when you're feeling um, in low mood or you're feeling stressed or anxious. Um, uh, and it will it, it will help in the in the medium term. And there's things like we've talked about upbeat music, exercise, um, uh, making yourself laugh, things like that. If you can um, keep that episode of Friends that you watched 350 times already uh, on your laptop, and and uh, and then have a look at that when you're feeling uh, when you're feeling a bit uh, stressed. And um, we keep going back as well to mindfulness. Um, and it's simple and it's useful. And uh, it gets you back into the present uh, rather than uh, losing your head in the future, uh, and especially in future scenarios that, that may not even happen. Uh, and getting back into the present uh, it is always a good, a good thing. Mm. Amazing. And be sure to jump out and get the anxiety epidemic or maybe not jump out because if you're in lockdown, but it's a brilliant book available on Amazon. I highly recommend it. I absolutely love reading it. Um, Professor Davey, where can people find you? Online. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, online. Um, I've, uh, I, I, I've got a couple of, of websites and blogs i, I do a, a regular blog for psychology today 
um, uh, on on anxiety uh, problems and worrying. And uh, I usually stick up a new blog every three months uh, uh, talking about different aspects of anxiety and anxiety disorders. Uh, and then I have my, my own website, which provides um, some details about the research that we've done at Sussex on anxiety. Um, and that's uh, at the website, which is um, called Papers from Sidcup, all one word. And uh, we'll, we, Everything want, will be linked anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, do have a look at that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um... Is, is there anything else that I, I, I may have missed? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, anxiety is a, is, is, is a big topic. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the message I want to leave people with is that uh, anxiety is, if you have a problem with anxiety, it is eminently treatable. Uh, it, it, and it is eminently survivable and it's overcomable and it's manageable. Um, so you can do it with the right help and support. Beautiful. Professor Gravy, Davy Gravy. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. That's what I was called in school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Nikki. I've enjoyed it.